Alright, we are going to do Isaiah chapter 29 today. If you would like to turn in your Bibles and follow along. And I also did want to share something before we got started. You know, we're, um, we're doing the stuff on YouTube and um, now we've got this new page and everything. And when you're spreading God's Word, uh, you know, this is not about notoriety or money or anything like that. It's about because there's so many people hungry today. And part of that's going to be in my message today as well. Um, there's a young lady that reached out to me and left me a message. And I got that message this morning. Uh, some 20 years ago, when me and my wife had our youth ministry, uh, this, this young lady was in it. And uh, I might have seen her twice, three times. I mean, I don't know, 20 years probably. But uh, she messaged me this morning and, and said that when her mama passed, that the videos had helped her get through some very dark times. And so many people are hurting and, you know, they just need love and encouragement. And so it's so important for us to be spreading the Word of God. And that is an easy way to do it because all you got to do is push a button and it can go. We don't know how many people it goes to. Um, basically what we're doing today, which... Uh, I've been kind of led to do a lot of prophecy here, and I'm going to tell you something. The book of Isaiah is a fantastic, fantastic book. And a lot of people say, well, uh, you know, why do you teach out of the Old Testament? Because a lot of people don't teach out of the Old Testament. 1 Corinthians 10 11 says, Now these things happened unto them for ensamples, and they are written for our correction upon the whom the ends of the world have come. Everything in that Old Testament and every story that's in it is an example written for me and you. And so much prophecy in the Old Testament concerning this end time generation. Um, right off the bat, when we uh, basically the deeper part of this is, is what transpires in the very end time before Jesus Christ comes to this earth and Satan is sitting in the temple of God claiming to be God. Uh, which is documented in 2 Thessalonians 2 4. All right? But it is also written for our correction to understand the things that are taking place in our world today that is just uh, an abomination in the sight of God. And God is not happy. Amen. And we live in one of the most blessed nations in the world. And some people don't understand why is that? Because we are one of the tribes of the 12 tribes of Israel being the blessed nation in the world. There's no doubt in that in my mind that you can track the migration when they come over into the Europeans and the United States and Canada. This word is written to all of God's children. So even though he is addressing Judah here in a way, it's still, I've never seen so much scripture. I told my wife, I said, I, I hate to even do it in a sermon. I want to sit down and do it, videotape it because it's so good. But all of God's Word is powerful, and it all has a lesson for us today. Alright, so verse 1. Woe unto Ariel, to Ariel, the city where David dwelt. Now this is where David dwelt when he was the king over the twelve tribes. And year to year, let them kill their sacrifices. So this is talking about Jerusalem. It is talking about Mount Zion, because that is where Christ will return. Now this word Ariel... Uh, in the Hebrew text is the Lion of God. There's two different meanings here. Or the Hearth of God, which is the pit. So the best one that's going to suit this description we're going to be talking about is the fire pit. All right? uh, the city was uh, used to be called uh, Jebus. And when David took it over, God changed the name of it to Jerusalem. All right? So it is Jerusalem of what we know today. Alright, so this prophecy is concerning us. So he's saying, God's saying, go ahead and set up your sacrifices. And keep in mind what's going to be taking place in that place at the end. Okay? He's fixing to do some correcting. Verse 2. Yet I will distress Ariel, and there shall be heaviness and sorrow, and it shall be unto me as Ariel, the fire pit. Who is I will distress it? It's God. God is going to distress it. Uh, he's going to do some correcting here. And he's saying, go ahead and set your sacrifices up on that altar. Verse 3, and I will camp against thee round about. Folks, if you've got God against you today, you've got problems. Now, God gets tired 
of correcting his children, they fall away, then they come back. They fall away and they come back. Look how many times that Israel fell short. And how can we how many times do we fall short today? I mean, you know, hey, the good thing about it is when you get a repentant heart and you ask God to forgive you, you can be forgiven of your sins because of the sacrifice that God made for us. Amen. And uh, but his children continue to fall short time and time again. <clears throat> All right. Uh, so basically, they're trying. He's saying you can't build a wall to keep me out. And that's what I love about people who get offended because we pray in school or they might get offended because we talk about God and these different things. But guess what? They can never, ever stop us from worshiping or praising our Father. Amen. You can be standing in a grocery store line and be saying a prayer in your mind and our Father hears it. Amen. They can't stop it. And God's not going to let them stop it. Verse 4. And thou shalt be brought down. He's talking about that great city in the end generation. And shalt speak out of the ground, and thy speech shall be low out of the dust, and thy voice shall be as one that hath a familiar spirit. This familiar spirit is an evil spirit. Out of the ground, and thy speech shall whisper out of the dust. God is going to grind it down to dust. It says in the New Testament, he says that upon his return he shall destroy it and there not be a stone left. I'm going to read a scripture in Matthew 3, 12. You don't have to go there. Whose fan is the hand and he will thoroughly purge his floor and gather his wheat into the garner, but he will burn up the chaff of the unquenchable fire. Now why do I, why do I read that? Because so many Christians today are taught that they're not going to be here for the great tribulation. But you will be here for the great tribulation. But guess what? You don't have anything to fear. Because you're going to know the truth and the Word of God. He does not correct those that did nothing wrong with the ones that did something wrong. Verse 5. Moreover, the multitude of thy strangers shall be like small dust, and the multitude of the terrible ones shall be as chaff that passeth away. Yea, it shall be instant, and it shall be suddenly. Verse 6, Thou shalt be visited upon the Lord of hosts with thunder, and with earthquake, and with great noise, with storm and tempest, and the flame devouring the fire. Did you know that God is a consuming fire? Yes. Hebrews 12, 29. He is a consuming fire. It's going to scorch those who don't get it right. It's going to scorch those who don't believe in God and who were deceived. But the Holy Spirit, how does it make you feel? It's warm. It gives us peace. It gives us strength. Verse 7. And the multitude of all nations that fight against Ariel, even all that fight against her and her munitions and that distress her, shall be as a dream of a vision night. This is talking about empty souls. They are going to wake up and think that they have had a bad dream. How many people in the world are going to be deceived? How many people in the world are not being taught God's Word today? How many people in the world are not reading their Bibles today? All these things are going to transpire that it says is going to transpire in this Bible. And one day, when it's too late, they're going to wake up and think that it was all a bad dream. Well, it's a bad dream, all right? It's a bad reality for those who do not get it right. As numerous as the sand to see. Yes, sir. Revelation chapter 20 says those that would follow Satan to the pit are numerous as the sands of the sea. How many granules of sand are even when you scoop it up in your hand? Now, could you imagine that many of God's children that would still follow Satan in this end time, thinking that he is Jesus Christ? Verse 8. If this shall be as when hunger man dreameth, and he beholdeth, and he eateth, but he waketh, and his soul is empty. How many people go to church today when they leave, they feel like they are still on empty? Because they're not being taught. The Word of God. You come here each and every Sunday to be fed of the Word of God. Not to listen to my words, but to listen to God's Word. Amen. Amen. 
Or as when a thirsty man dreameth, and he behold, he drinketh, but he awaketh. And behold, he is faint, and his soul hath appetite, starving to death. When I go out and do different Bible studies in different places besides those of you who've been studying here for a while, it's just like they've just never heard it before. And it is God's Word, but they're not being taught it. And so shall the multitude of all the nations that fight against Mount Zion. Amos 8, 11. Behold, the days cometh, saith the Lord God, that I will send a famine in the land. Not a famine for bread or a thirst for water, but of hearing the words of the Lord. <coughs> Verse 9. Stay yourselves and wonder. Cry ye out and cry. They are drunken, but not with wine. They stagger, but not with strong drink. They are spiritually drunk with false traditions and traditions of men in the churches today. Verse 10. For the Lord hath poured out upon you the spirit of deep sleep and hath closed your eyes. The prophets and your rulers, the seers, hath they covered. How many times did Jesus Christ say in the New Testament when He's teaching His parables? He said, Whoever has eyes to see and ears to hear. Romans 11, 8 says that God hath, for it is written that God hath given them the spirit of slumber, eyes that they should not see and ears that they should not hear. And people ask me, say, well, why would God do that? Why would He intentionally let some of His children be deceived and yet others have their eyes open and know the truth? Because He loves them. You say, what do you mean? Well, if you do something out of ignorance that you don't know any better, then God will not judge you to hell for it. And there's just some people that cannot handle the truth of God's Word and what's coming. They would rather believe what some preacher tells you that you don't have to know the Bible. You don't have to know the book of Revelations. Just believe me. How many times have you heard that before? I've had to heard that plenty of times in my life. Just believe me, son. You don't need to understand the Bible. You do need to understand the Bible. It is written to you and me. To be read, to be digested, to be absorbed, to be prepared for the end generation. Verse 11. And the vision of all is become unto you as the words of a book. This is how bad. Now this is, this is going on today. So really absorb and think about what this is saying. Unto you is the words of a book. What book? This book that is sealed, which men deliver to one that is learned, saying, Read this, I pray thee, and he saith, I cannot, for it is sealed. Verse 12, And the book is delivered to him that is not learned, saying, Read this, I pray thee, and he saith, I am not learned. The Word of God is not being taught today in the world. And they're passing the buck. You go to somebody and you say, Please, I don't understand this. Could you explain it to me? Well, I don't know. I don't know. But you better go to so-and-so. So then they go to the unlearned. Please, can you explain this book to me? They don't know it. Because they're unlearned. And they're passing the book. Verse 13. I've known this scripture for a long time. It's really good. Verse 13. Wherefore the Lord said, for as much as the children draw near to me with their mouth. <laughs> now what does that mean? That means like we come into church every Sunday, people fill the church houses, and they praise God and praise Jesus with their mouth. Right? Give glory to God. And with their lips they do honor me, but have removed their hearts far from me. Heart can be translated mind as well as heart. And their fear toward me is taught by the precepts of men. I know the denomination me and my wife came up in in our own youth group that they preached hell, fire, and damnation. You're going to hell if you wear these kind of clothes. You're going to hell if you get, to get divorced. And all these different things scaring people into salvation. We have a loving God. We have a God of restoration. And I know it's really hard, isn't it? All we have to do is love Him. Oh, it's terrible. 
He gave His life on the cross. Let His only begotten Son die because He loves us. And so many people today, they just don't care. They don't want to hear it. 2 Timothy 2.15 says, Study to show thyself approved unto God. What did it say? Study to show yourself approved unto God. A workman that needeth not to be ashamed, but rightly dividing the word of truth. It is so easy to divide the word of truth. A good start for you is find the subject. You got a favorite verse? Find the subject. It might start in the middle of the chapter before and end at the chapter after. But you've got to rightly divide the Word so you understand what God's Word is saying. People say, well, Brother Timmy, I don't understand the Word. Does Jesus Christ not say, pray for it? Yes, pray amen. for it and He will give it to you abundantly. Amen. God led someone into my mother's life some 20 years ago that taught her how to study the Bible and then she taught me how to study the Bible. You can understand the Word of God. You don't have to have somebody translate it for you. The tools are available. And you say, Father, I want to understand this. And you pray about it. And He'll give it to you. And if He don't give it to you, He'll lead someone in your life today that will teach you Amen. just the way they taught me. The way I'm teaching you. This is a discipleship. We learn and we study. And what are we supposed to do with that? Put it under a bed or a bushel? No. Spread God's Word and teach the truth. Absolutely. Verse 14. Therefore, behold, I will proceed to do a marvelous work among this people, even a marvelous work and wonder, for the wisdom of their wise men shall perish. All those false prophets, all those false teachers, judgment begins at the house of God. 1 Peter 4, 17. And if it first begins at me, and then it's your turn next. He's not going outside the church walls. He starts in the house of God. And the understanding of their prudent men shall be hid. Verse 15. Woe unto them that seek deep to hide their counsel from the Lord. And their works are in the dark. And they say, Who seeth us? And who knoweth us? I love it in our parts of life. A lot of people think that, you know, when they're doing things wrong and nobody sees them or they're ripping somebody off and nobody catches them, well, ain't, ain't nobody going to see us. God sees everything. Mm -hmm. You're not going to do any, anything in your life today. I want you to really think about that. And I'm not trying to shame y'all because I'm just as embarrassed as the next person and done plenty of my share of sinning and doing wrong. But just really think about some of the things you've done in your life and God is watching you. We don't look at it at that level, but the people who like to dwell in darkness, they think they're getting away with what they're doing. But I promise you, the day of recompense is coming very, very quickly and rapidly today. So they're not going to get away with anything. You're not going to pull the wool over God's eyes. Now this is one of my favorite verses in here too. Surely your turning of things upside down shall be esteemed as the potter's clay. So shall the work say unto him that made it, He made me not. Or so shall the thing framed say unto him that framed it, He hath no understanding. Now let's break that verse down. God is the potter. We are the clay. I can give several examples of this. Let's just take uh, uh, people who are born a male or female and then they go out and they have surgery to be turned opposite of what God made them in. Are they saying to God, you made a mistake. I'm not supposed to be a man. I'm supposed to be a woman. God does not make mistakes. Amen. Something else just in the personal walk of all that. You know, God made us all uniquely. Isaiah 64, 8, it says, But now, O Lord, Thou art the clay, and we are, or they, you, Thou art the potter, and we are the clay. You know, God did not make a mistake. There's a lot of people hurting in this world today. There's a lot of people that are depressed today. There are a lot of people who have lost things in their lives today. But you know what? Don't ever look in the mirror and say, You know what? I'm ugly. 
I can't do this. I can't do that. I'm not smart enough to have this job. And don't let anybody else tell you the same thing. Come on. Don't do that. God made you who you are. You are uniquely made. So don't ever do that to yourself. Don't ever put yourself down. God has a purpose for everybody. 17. Is it not yet a very little while and Lebanon shall be turned into a fruitful field and the fruitful field shall be esteemed as the forest. So the fruitful field are God's chosen people. People think, uh, they just don't think about what's going on in the world today. But at the end of it all, it will be a fruitful field when God gets done with what's coming. And in that day shall the death hear the words of this book. Those that were deceived. Those that didn't care. Those that say, I don't believe in God. There's no God. They will wake up when Jesus Christ returns to this earth. And the eyes of the blind shall see out of obscurity and out of darkness. 19. The meek also shall increase their, increase in their joy in the Lord. And the poor among men shall rejoice in the Holy One of Israel. The humble, not the haughty. Us that overcome us that love the Lord enough to come to church on Sunday. Love the Lord enough to be in prayer and to be in His Bible. You've got a great reward coming. Verse 20. For the terrible one is brought to naught. Who is the terrible one? It's Satan. He will be brought to naught. And the scorner is consumed. Who are the scorners? The naysayers out there. I've tried to witness to a lot of people throughout the day, and there's a lot of them that do not want to hear it. But I'm going to tell you something. There's going to come a day. And they're going to stand before God and say, Oh God, well I just didn't know. Nobody ever told me. And God's going to say, Oh yes, Doug, Holcomb told you, and you wouldn't listen. <laughs> what about the parable of Lazarus and the rich man? And the rich man went to hell and he could see Lazarus in the bosom of Abraham. And he was wanting Lazarus to come over and take a, a drop of water and put it on his tongue to cool his tongue. And the rich man begged. Uh, Abraham said, can you please send somebody back to my family that, that, that you can help them, teach them so that they are not in the same condemnation that I am in. And what did Abraham tell him? He said they had Moses. They had Daniel. They had Jeremiah. They had Ezekiel. There is no excuse. There is no excuse. And we will all stand before the judgment seat of Christ Amen. to receive the things done in our own bodies. Ain't no preacher going to be standing there with you. No lawyer. Your best friend, your lawyer, ain't going to be standing there with you. It's just you and God then. I hate to be one of these out there that say that, you know, well, I just don't, I just don't have time. And I'm thinking, you don't have time to give God an hour of your time a week. Really? But yet, let something happen in their lives. A calamity. A disaster. A loss of loved one. Oh, dear God, please help me. Oh, wait a minute. There's a God now. He'll hear their cry, but that don't mean He'll answer their prayer. Proverbs 8, 17 says, I love them that love Me, and those that seek Me early shall find Me. When you love Him and spend time with Him, you're going to find Him because He's right there with you. Verse 21 that make a man an offender for the word, and lay a snare for him that reproveth in his gate, and turn aside the just for the thing of not. The offender of the word, because they don't know it, or they're misled, or they're mistaught, in part their own fault. They like to take the word of God and let it suit their own needs instead of what God intended it to be. Therefore, thus saith the Lord who redeemed Abraham concerning the house of Jacob, Jacob shall not be ashamed, neither shall his face now wax pale. Why? Because they will wake up. Remy. 
Remy, sit down. Verse 23, but when he seeth his children, the work of mine hands is in the midst of him, they shall sanctify my name, sanctify the Holy One of Jacob, and shall fear the God of Israel. There's coming a time, I promise you, when Jesus Christ gets back to this earth that every knee will bow before the King of kings and Lord of lords. Amen. 24, they also that erred in spirit shall come to understanding and they that murmured shall learn doctrine. What doctrine is that? It's Jesus Christ. It's the Bible. They might as well get familiar with it now. You might as well read it and learn it now because it will be in the eternity. So you can either know it now and have the victory or you can learn it later and possibly go to hell. Can I get an amen? Amen. Would everyone please bow your heads?